Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Ezekiel. I'm head of marketing and sales at ShapeDiver. And this is the Efficiency Boost Computational Design in AEC webinar. Today, we have the pleasure of showcasing how several of our clients in the AEC sector have successfully embraced parametric design and cloud computing to drive efficiency gains in their day-to-day -day operations. During this webinar, we will learn how Cake Houses, Construsoft, WebJet engineers, and Core Studio leverage Grasshopper and ShapeDiver to transform their design and construction processes. Each of our guests will have 20 minutes to present their case study, followed by 10 minutes for Q&A with the audience. Several members of our ShapeDiver team will monitor all incoming questions in the Q&A section, which is located on the left side of your screen. These questions will be shared with our panelists after each presentation. In case there are questions we don't have time to answer during these 10 minutes, we will have an additional final Q&A by the end of the webinar. Today, you'll learn that through the power of Grasshopper and ShapeDiver, these companies have created online applications that help them streamline their workflows and deliver their projects faster, more efficiently, and with greater precision. By the end of this event, you will have gained insights into how computational design and cloud computing can help you gain a competitive advantage in the AEC industry. As a fun fact, we're streaming this live event from multiple countries such as Mexico, Austria, the US, the Czech Republic, Venezuela, Argentina, and the UK. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first guest is Matthias from Cake Houses. How are you, Matthias? Hi, hello, I'm Matthias Schwedig from Prague. Uh, I will share my screen, my presentation and start. Hello again, I'm Matthias Schwedig from, uh, from a company called Cake Houses. We, we, we are based in Prague. Uh, we are three architects who studied here in Prague and also in Liberec. And uh, this is us, I'm on the right side. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we, we started to uh, thinking about uh, houses, uh, about type houses uh, and, uh, and uh, how, to, how to make uh, configurable houses because the thing is that we, we we realize that a lot of lot of houses in Czech Republic and uh, all, all around the world is uh, is mostly type houses or catalog houses. So so pre-designed houses for for people who cannot customize it uh, anymore, or other other uh, other houses are from architects. But uh, these two these two areas are kind of far away from each other. Like like uh, type houses are pretty cheaper, easier easier to build. But they, they they are not prototypes. Uh, architecture buildings are archi or buildings designed by architects are always prototypes. Maybe nicer, but more 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 likely more expensive and uh, difficult to build, and also also time con consuming. So this is somehow our our main idea that we build configurable homes that combine architecture qualities and modern techno technology and also the the advantages of type houses uh, so as you can see on this on this picture the the main idea is to to create a, one house or let's let's see it on this picture uh, one house which has uh, different options because the 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 industry now works that uh, the company always uh, designed a lot of lot of houses and uh, the the client chooses one of them but we we started to make a new new and different approach which is uh, to build or design just one house and make uh, different iterations of it so it's it's the opposite opposite uh, approach we we design one house and we have uh, thousands or hundreds maybe of variations variations of this house which i will show you later uh, and that's why we had to use Grasshopper because to, to achieve this, we have to make the house or the design programmable and uh, to make it customized to, to, to all the clients we, we need. So uh, one thing is to use Grasshopper in our studio, in our office, but another thing is to show it to, to clients. And that's why uh, we have to have some kind of website and uh, on the website, we need to show the 3D models and all the, all the configurations. And that's where the shape diver is a really great solution. So that's why we decided to go with this because there is, to be honest, no another solution or not that easy a solution to, to work with. Uh, so how does it all work? 
as I said, it's it's a it's a made in grasshopper rhinoceros three D and shape diver. This is some kind of like a pipeline, and the main idea that we have uh, we have some somehow what something what I call vir vir virtual modu modularity because uh, I create a, or we create a, a lot of modules, uh, let's say blocks, which we can uh, connect together uh, uh, in grasshopper. And we can show them to our clients uh, in in Shape Diver. So when I show show it a bit more, it looks somehow like this. This is a screenshot from from our Rhino Rhino uh, Rhino file, where you can see that we have a different. Uh, this is just uh, just part of it. Uh, we have uh, different uh, rooms, let's say, but th there can be more of it. There can be uh, there can be uh, I don't know, for example, kitchens or or uh, walls or, or or windows and uh, and so on. So uh, so it's kind of like a physical physical uh, or let's say three D virtual model uh, that that uh, represent uh, uh, represent what will be in the building. So so. One thing is that we this model is always uh, combined uh, or uh, constructed with from more more parts. Like one is the the drawing, second one is like a three D axonometry, third one is for example three D uh, like realistic uh, model which we use for for uh, renderings. Another an, another another part is like three D printed. Uh, model which we make or skate model which we, we which we make in uh, all the architecture studies and so on and another thing is also that this uh, we we uh, take to the shape diver and and uh, show it there so this is like the grasshopper file uh, you can I, I call it engine because uh, somehow uh, it's similar to engine that you you have some inputs and uh, it, it processes them or processor maybe is better word, and uh, then you have some outputs. And uh, if I, it's kind of it's kind of complicated for, because you know uh, it's it's clustered, and uh, I, I will show it a, a bit more on simplified scheme. Anyway, uh, this this engine or this computation um, program made in Grasshopper can can provide us with all the variations. So, and all the combinations of the virtual modules, or let's say blocks, and uh, it can also provide us even illogical variations, which is not what we want, but it can do it. And I will later sh show how it uh, stopped to do illogical variations. Uh, and this is the simplified scheme that uh, we have the the virtual modules. So you see on the left uh, left bottom uh, side of the scheme. Uh, which is like the 3D representation of the rooms and and, uh, and the walls and all the roofs and all the stuff I said, and uh, the second input is uh, is uh, text uh, text input, which is like code uh, representing the the rooms or or let's say le re representing the house, and uh, these two inputs uh, are 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 uh, you know passed to the engine, which is which which process them. Uh, and uh, it's basically moving the 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 modules to the right place rotating them and then uh, having them in the right uh, layers and so on so it's kind of a lot of uh, computation and a lot of like uh, working with uh, with uh, because you, that's one of the challenges in this project is that when you have a blocks the grasshopper cannot really uh, work with them uh, well, so you have to somehow go around it, and so you have to like explode the block, and then then still keep all the tracks uh, uh, about the block because because if you want to put it back together, it it takes some some uh, some kind of uh, it takes a, some kind of you know skill to get it right together to right uh, right uh, layers and so on. And two outputs are like the big geometry, which is like mostly drawings, which we are pretty much ready made to print. Uh, it's like axonometry, which we also put in, into our like um, architecture study. We we also have the three D printed scape models, as, as I said, and also we have the virtual re reality, which uh, when where the, the our client can see the the house in the real time. The good thing is that we also can like uh, change the 
the let's say the text input which you see on the left side and uh, it also and it in real time changes the 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 model in a, in a rhino so we can present uh, all the variations in virtual reality in uh, in a real time so it's kind of fascinating how it how it works and and you really can use it to to, to show the clients the best variations for him and uh, the second output is shape diver uh, and that's uh, that's what I will show you later. But uh, but uh, the thing is that the shape diver can uh, also control the text input. Uh, so it's some kind of a loop. When when I change something in shape diver, it can change in a in a in a grasshopper, and then it, for example, change the virtual reality. So we use uh, shape diver not only to show show the 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 models or the variations on a on a website but we also use it as a controller for a for a for a grasshopper file uh, so this is like a simplified scheme of, of how it works i, I know it's uh, there's not much details about technical solutions but as i said it would be too too complicated and i probably couldn't explain it well and also i don't I, I programmed it like two two or three years ago so i can't remember it pretty, pretty well as well anyway uh and the third part is the the shape diver, uh, which which is like you can see it here. Like uh, like the, this is I will show you later the, the website, and uh, we have the shape diver embedded embedded viewer where you can uh, rotate and see and zoom and see the house inside as well. And also we have like our customized uh, or custom uh, JavaScript form. Uh, which is what uh, what controls the input, and uh, here is the the thing that uh, this input cannot be like illogical, as I said before. That, for example, it it it, it is not, not able to, for example, generate three uh, bathrooms behind uh, each other. So so that's the that's the one one good thing about it. But it's not done in a in a in a grasshopper. It's done in a in a let's say JavaScript, and uh, that's uh, why all the parts are important. Uh, okay, so let's see it. Uh, I guess in a in a on a on, a, on, a, on our website. I will show you it in, a, in in here. So I hope you see it. This is like our main page. Uh, the 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 main. Uh, Slogan is designer own sweet home, and here you see the 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 things we think that are beneficial for our clients. One thing is the optimal price and quality, uh, and uh, faster re realization because there is a lot of automatization uh, in the in the whole process, as as you as you could see before. And there is a uh, hundreds of variants of of the house. I will just slip through the, the the website because there are the the, the pictures or let's say renderings of, of the house uh, so so you can uh, you can see how, how it looks uh this is just our, our our partner which we work with in czech republic who should uh, who should build the houses and uh just just fastly through, through these pictures like this is for example the small one you can see that there is just like a short 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 house uh, uh, with just uh, one window downstairs and probably one room and, and the stairs upstairs uh, here you can see more variations that uh, it's not only uh, about the plan or about the disposition of, of the of the rooms but it's also about the, the, the materials and so it can be optimized for for all the the clients whatever they want the important thing is that the the model still stays the same as you can see it's the it's the triangle it's the it's it's the house uh, like from from the front you can see it still stay the same even though for for sure we can change the window to the to different one but the let's say the static static schemes should be uh, same uh <clears throat> another another variations and you can again see that it's uh it has a different facade but it has it has also also different uh, different uh, you know rooms inside because you can see it's just one here and another there uh this is probably the the best picture to show it because you can see uh different variations and it's about the length of the of the houses 
uh, the short one is such a like uh, cheaper and uh, but but more and 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 so on. But uh, but the scheme of the of the construction is still still the same. Also, the house is designed the way that we can put it on the on the on the property or on the site. Uh, ideal, ideally, to to the like the sunshine and stuff. Uh, that's why we have the corner window uh, and so on. This is like uh, more the inside and right. So and also this is an interesting picture maybe because this is how we uh, how we uh, like uh, finish our architecture study that we have some some kind of uh, prints but also the 3d printed house which is uh, which is uh, which is nice anyway i will go more to the the, the shape diver part and grasshopper part because this is the configurator where you can see the house and you can design uh, different sizes and uh, and so on you can see the price as well you can see the meters and disposition or floor, floor plan this is some kind of uh, mistakes anyway you can see the section uh, of of the house that uh, there is like a, uh, yeah the section the stairs the, the 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 rooms if i put more more rooms in here you you see that the the house goes la larger but the the structure construction is still the same uh, you can see the second floor the plan of the second floor maybe i can put the the elevated living room so so some void in in there so you can go you can see f from the from the first floor to the second one and so on and so on but this configurator is is, is uh, just to show our clients that we can have uh, different options of of the disposition of the floor plans uh, but that that's not all because we can make a uh, we can make uh, even even more variations because this is uh, this is uh, just a part of it because we have another another ed editor which is more like for uh, for our our uh, purposes and uh, it has a different different uh, user interface which is more complicated and that's why we don't uh, show it to our clients uh because uh, because it would just make make them confused we guess but but i can show you it here so so this is like the the main interface where i i put like rooms uh for example this is lr is like living room uh, and a sta is a stairs so so i put like for example of some basic house like this even illogical without bathroom but you can see it it changed it the house to this very variation okay i see i don't have a bathroom so maybe i should have some or uh, okay then i have uh, i have master bedroom downstairs from free models and a bathroom here so you, you can see that the, the model is changing and hopefully it, it changed it now nice so i can see now the 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 ground or first floor plan you see the big living room, the master bedroom, the toilet, and so on. I can see also the, the second floor, uh, where you can see the, the room, this another room, another room, and, and the bathroom in here. If I don't want the room in here, I put I can put the white, for example. So I will have a hole through through the through the house. Uh, but it's it's kind of nice because you can see the the, the whole building, or it's like. A, it's like small courtyard in the in the building and also i can see the the, the section but the, the the important thing is that if i if i have uh, such a such a house in here i have like you know uh configured i can i can click here and i see the code of the house and this is the input of the grasshopper file so if i put this one this code to the grasshopper it will generate me uh, the house in the Rhino, and so on and so on. So it will generate me the 3D model. It will generate me the the virtual reality. It will generate me like kind of kind of everything. Okay, now it's not real time. It doesn't go to the grasshopper, but uh, it can be done as well. But I would need a server for this because for logical reasons. So this is our our uh, our like. Uh, inside configurator which we use only to show the clients all the variations or let's say the variations that that they want 
uh, so so make them like uh, make it precise and we can just make for example the living room smaller and they see it in real time in in uh, virtual reality and so on uh, so that's pretty much that's pretty much uh, it from me uh, I can also say that we use uh, Brucia printers for for the 3d printers and virtual reality we, we use Enscape and and uh, in the grasshopper we use uh, human uh, human plugin which is pretty important for us uh, and uh, also Ezekiel asked me about some challenges so I, I have to say that there is uh, there is the, this challenge with uh, with Mac and PC because I'm a Mac user and uh, it's difficult to to use Grasshopper in a in a in a in a Mac environment sometimes but uh, for example, this doesn't work very much. I mean, I can try to reprogram, like program it again, but uh, but uh, it's much more difficult to make it in a, in a in a Mac because it goes somehow wrong and uh, and so on. Another thing is that uh, that the the blocks in a grasshopper are not uh, pretty. Like you know, there is this problem that you cannot import blocks, and the manipulation with them is also kind of problematic. So you can do it with a human uh, human plugin, which is good, but still it's difficult because it will it will just destroy the 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 block to the to the lines and so on. So so the, to the basic geometry. But that's okay. I mean, you can go around that. And the another problem or the challenge, the big challenge is to to like synchro synchronize everything because uh, you have always the modules of uh, of like of of let's say the plans, let's say the 3D printed, let's say the 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 model for shape driver and so on. So so to keep the track on whether it's synchronized or not, it, it somehow may be uh, a bit difficult. So that's probably it for me. Uh, it, it's right. supposed to be 20 minutes, so I guess. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias. I mean, uh, we didn't receive any any questions, but Mathieu Huard here is our co-founder and head of product at Shave Diver. Hi, Mathieu, how are you? Hey, uh, yeah, uh, I'm good, thanks. And thank you for your uh, great presentation, but yes. Um, uh, lots of interesting things here, especially, of course, we didn't know your internal internal uh, editor, which is a, a nice uh, a nice detail that you developed for yourself. That, that's really interesting. Uh, and I already have a question about this one because uh, that's like a really important point what you what you mentioned and which uh, which how to find the balance between um, you know the complexity you show to the end users because uh, if I understand correctly, the the configurator is meant for individual. Uh, uh, customers, it's not for uh, uh, urban planners, or it's really for the people who are going to buy the houses, mm -hmm. who probably don't have a lot of technical uh, background. And you have this internal tool that can do more, but you chose not to show uh, all of it. So, how would you say that the tool you have on the website satisfies most of the needs of the of most people, or or do you use it more as like a presentation, and then they come to you with questions, and you can maybe go a bit deeper with your internal tool? Yeah, that's that's somehow problematic. I know because uh, because yeah, because it would be nicer to show them all the variations. Because when I when I go here, it seems like there is just a few of them. So I have to have like this like uh, star here to, sh to to say that there is just like more possibilities and and more like layouts of of the plan. So so it's uh, it's maybe just a design uh, like flaw or fault that we cannot like make it easier to. To, to them to to work with such a configurator like like is this one, but uh, from the point of like UX designer, it was it was kind of simpler to make this uh, this uh, form and uh, yeah, so it, it works like it should showcase like some variations and uh, they should come and we should we show them more of them, uh, more variations and, uh, and yeah, that uh, makes sense. That's how it should work, but but but. It's also interesting what you said about the planners or urban planners. We we think that it could be like nice uh, nice tool, for example, for developers when you can like because the the main one of the the reasons why we started this project is that when you go through the through the new build you know like new let's say new builded houses uh, 
around Prague, for example, you see a lot of like uh, similar or same houses on one place. And that's somehow like, uh, it's kind of, we don't pretty much like it. We like it, we would like it more like customized. And this is, this is for us, let's say the way that it's not only customized that you have a different color of the facade. It's, it's customized because you have maybe more children or maybe you like to, I don't know, uh, have a gym in your house so you need uh, one more room so this is for us some something which might be in the future used by developers uh, as well and for sure they could use this like uh, internal tool which is um, much more uh, interesting in a way so in a, in a, in a you know that there, it, it has a lot of more variation Perfect. So we mm -hmm. have about so about six minutes before we need to change mm -hmm. to the next presentation. We yeah. have received some questions, Matthew. Maybe you wanna you know select some of those. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll start, and uh, we can of course go back at the end. We'll have a general Q and A for everyone, so we can always go back uh, to that. But um, the first two questions by our attendee Eric uh, are about a bit concrete. Uh, if you, what's the status of the project? How many houses have been built uh, according to the to the system? And if you have maybe some construction photos or some some something uh, concrete. Yeah. Uh, about them. So so that's that's a good question, and it's also uh, yeah we we just started, and we to be honest, or not just started, but we didn't do much of uh, marketing. We 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 for example one important thing for us was to to find a partner so when i go back to our website and click here uh, i can also show you that uh, there is a shape diver also in uh, in our partners website it also shows so this is it but uh, we to to answer the question we build the first one uh, or we are now building it and uh, here it's a, it's a it's a configuration the same one in a, in a different design and I, I can show you photographs but the, the problem is that the the first one is not uh, or I have I have them in the presentation <laughs> it's it's here uh, so this is how it looks uh, how, how it's being built so this is the first one and we have some like uh, we designed uh, or made the architecture study for another one and we we've been asked for some some more but to be honest it's not like in a, in a building state right now so it's just like uh, we we hope that, that there will be more of it um and but we will see that the one thing is that we we partnership with the with the neban and uh, that's that's kind of important for us because this this building is not uh, built with them and it has a lot of troubles uh, but uh, still, we hope that it's gonna end up well, and it's gonna like show how 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 nice the building can be, how how uh, well designed it is, and uh, with the with the help with our partner, we guess that we will make the building even even much nicer and even cheaper and faster to build. Okay. Yeah. So very nice. Yeah. Um, we have a uh, we have a few uh, uh, questions that are more technical about the process of uh, mm -hmm. Grasshopper and like connecting everything with Shapediver. Maybe we keep these as a bundle uh, for for the end. Uh, there mm -hmm. was one question a bit more uh, specific to uh, the outputs of the configurator and how close you are maybe to um, construction uh, documents and things that can already be used by your partner or by by uh, the, mm -hmm. the contractors. Um, so maybe you can tell us a word about this. Yeah. So right now it works that like like that that we have uh, a lot of uh, drawings so to architecture study are uh, automat automatized uh, with this tool so we can we can like uh, when we have the code uh, the, the the grasshopper will provide us with a pretty nice drawings yes yeah, sometimes you have to manually touch them for sure and for sure you have to make the site uh, you know site drawings because uh, that's like always specific for the place but but in in uh, like the sections and plans they are mostly generated and also the models for the renderings as i said are generated so so there is a lot of automatization which which uh, which reduces the 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 time to to, to create it and uh, to be honest we don't have like uh, the plans for uh, for uh, for like the, the construction itself, and that's because we, as I said, we still we made the architecture study, but 
but we still didn't uh, make uh, with our partner the, the the first building so when we gonna uh, when we gonna do it then we will have to like uh, connect our systems because then they use our archicad and i'm, I'm kind of curious about how how it's gonna work because i guess it will but it, it will be another challenge because the systems are different and even though they did you can somehow connect them uh, but i've never done it but i hope <laughs> i will somehow manage uh i, I think it, it it will somehow work and we will see but that but that's uh, that's not that's the future for right now it's not done yet uh, right now it, it is automatized to the pictures to the, the basic drawings and so on but not to the construction process Maybe we can squeeze one quick one from Ben Ho, who's actually one of the presenters today. He said, can you tell us about your front-end web development stack? Interested to know about your experience building around the Shape Diver Viewer. Maybe you can answer, you know, precise answer, one, two minutes on how you, you know, the, the, the web development stack, it's just to share a little bit about it. Oh, that's that's kind of, the thing is that I'm, uh, I did all of this. I did the website, I did the, 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 the Grasshopper and uh, everything. So. So, and I'm not, I'm architect, I'm not a programmer. So it's kind of difficult for me to talk about the uh, web design and so on, because it's it's pretty much uh, the process. And uh, and I use this like this, uh, yeah, this one page like uh, setup, which, which, which works fine somehow, but it has a lot of, lot of flaws, a lot of uh, problem mistakes or, or errors in there. And I'm still like uh, trying to, to make it better and better and still, still changing it. So, so it's kind of difficult for me to, 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 to discuss the web development uh, ideas, but mostly it's like, like, this is like, uh, let's say JavaScript uh, driven uh, plugin, which, which is like one page one page JavaScript, I guess it's even, in, it's even called. And then, then I use uh, the, the, the shape driver and, and my own JavaScript and PHP uh, form. So, so that's how it's done. But to be honest, to, to discuss more details. <laughs> All right, no problem. So the rest of the questions, we will leave them for the uh, final Q and A. Yeah. There were yeah. still three, four that were quite interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, you know, yeah. I think you're a great example of you know all all sizes. You know, the reason why we why we chose Cake House is just to prove that also a small team of entrepreneurs can leverage the power of parametric design and shape diver. So it's not just meant to. Uh, the other example we have today are of course more complex, bigger teams, bigger companies. But mm -hmm. we wanted to show that even you know an individual architect thinking of starting something on their own, it is possible uh, in nowadays with the technologies that are available. Uh, like yeah. shape diver and just, just one thing to this, I would say that it would be much nicer to have a bigger team. <laughs> 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 yeah, eventually. Hopefully, once you start building the house, uh, the real houses. All right, Matthias, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Now it's the time to start with ConstruSoft first. It's a two part, uh, 10 minute and 10 minute. First, we start with David Acevedo. David, I am going to make you a presenter and you're going to have to select your video and audio. So, making your presenter. All right, uh, thank you, David. How are you? You're in Venezuela. Yes, yes, I am in Venezuela. Um, well, I I'm gonna share you my screen. Yes, yes, complete the screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Well, uh, good morning and good night or good evening, depends of the your location in in the world in this moment. I am. My name is David Acevedo. I am from Venezuela. Um, I with my colleague, uh, Manuel Amicone, uh, we are going to present uh, present you the the two tools that we are developed in Grohopper uh, with Shape Diver uh, to, to generate parametric solutions to our customers. So first we are going to talk uh, a little about us, we um, and my colleague working in ConstruSoft. ConstruSoft is a uh, a big company of uh, tech solutions in the AC industry where we sell uh, tech solutions like, for example, software like Consteel, Diamonds, Idea, Statica. And we generate uh, personalized uh, tools like the, the, the tools we are going to show you. And my colleague and, and I uh, work principally in, the, in the Latin America and Spain market and uh, well we 
we are going to talk about three three parts of the of the session now uh, the principal three parts of these sessions are the main reasons for using Wahoo Operational Diver in our in, in our work uh, and the two tools that we developed in Grahopper, a star model that is, is a precise model and computing parts in Grahopper, and Optinave that is a uh, finite elements method in in, in cloud computing. So uh, we are going to start principally in the main reasons of for using Grahopper and Shape Diver. Well the, the the first thing that we want to share to you is the the, the concept of Grahopper and Shape Diver is the visual programming. So the, this is a principal reason that we use Grahopper because it's a visual programming, it's easy to implement in, in our customer, to our customers. And Shape Diver is a cloud computing that we use to uh, com to compute or generate all the geometries and all the the data that we share with the customer. So uh we think in three things when we use Grahopper or we present Grahopper to our customers. And the three things are improve improve the workflow of of, of them. Uh, for example, generating the geometry easily and fastly. Uh, the complex geometry, for example, that is difficult to generate in the software. Uh, the typical software of the traditional software engineers is really easy to, to generate these complex geometries in Grahopper, and we can use this to, to, to improve the workflows of the customers. And the easy implementation in the companies of these two tools, because uh, Grahopper is really, is really easy to understand uh, because it's like a, a flow chart, for example, and Shape Diver is uh, makes the the algorithms more more simplex because because we can generate complex algorithms and upload in Grahopper and generate a, a simple uh, interface that we can or, or the final user can uh, interact with the with the, this simple. Um, interface and generate the 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 data or the, that depends of the of the output that the customers want well um, for show you these these types of or, or this this advantage of these tools we we have two tools that we developed in Grahopper and uh, the first is a star model the star model is two things is an a company and a, a system of construction uh that per, that allows to construct uh, simple models of steel ex, uh, structures without welds only with bolt connections uh, and they they generate they they, they construct the, the connections and with a pack of connections and with a, a group of, of parts of steel elements they can construct any any types of of, of structures. Well, uh, the first thing that they have in 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 a star model, they they had a lot of a lot of Excel files that with that they they create. I am going to share with you uh, the the Excel files. They they had a, a lot of Excel files like this, for example. And if they want to change the type of the topology of the structure, uh, they have to use a different a different Excel file in 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 all of them. No, yeah, you can see uh, each Excel file is generated for one type of the topology of the structure and. Um, with Grahopper, we generate for them. We started translated all of these Excel files in Grahopper. I am going to show you the Grahopper file, the Grahopper algorithms, and we we translated all the rules or the geometrical rules, all the 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 mathematical rules to from these Excel files to Grahopper. Well, we have here. This is a long. <laughs> a large uh, Grahopper definition and we 
generate this this graph hopper definition based in a template uh, of, of colors and depends of the of the process. And we cut the process in in different in different parts uh, that you can see here: one, two, three, or five, six parts that we can generate uh, uh, the the final data of the of the customer need. So. Uh, in this first part, we can generate the geometrical the geometrical relations between the the for example, I, I can you can see here. We can we define here the the geometrical relations like for example the distance between the columns, the distance between the columns of the column of the of the door, the distance be, between the beams or the the, the amount of the poor links, for example, only geometrical and mathematical rules here. And we generate this, these two groups that is really important, the inputs of this process and the outputs of this process. And with this output, we generate another another data depend of the, of the process uh, that we want to do in this second part of the process. We can generate uh, all the visual, visualization information. For example, if we here, we can see that we generate here the columns, for example, uh, the principal columns, the, the columns of the middle, and the last columns, so the columns of the bottom. And we can generate the columns of the door. That depends of the of the part uh, that we can we want to generate in this soup process this is like a soup soup process and um, the poor links for example in this um finally in this part we generate all the uh, all the connections now if you if we uh, select this part we can see all the connections that we generate precisely in 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 graph hopper and um, each 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 uh, connection had a code and in this other part is the we count all the connections, all the steel parts, all and assign all the labels, all this the 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 steel code. For example, if we can see here uh, data of this connection, for example, we can see here the code of the connection and the 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 quantity of these connections in the model. And with this, we generate all the data. Here is the uh, practically the the engine of the of, of the group of the uh, generation data, uh, the, the the text data or, or the data of quantity of the of the elements of the connections, for example. And well, we uh, with this final part, with this final part, we generate. All the outputs in Shape Diver, for example, we generate here the labels, and we can see here uh, the, the the location of the labels. Uh, here, the base of the labels, for example, we generate all the the, the outputs that the final user will go to show. Uh, will go to see in the in the or, or we want to show in the. In the final model in Shape Diver, and we generate here the PDF data. Only all of this part of the algorithms is generation data to output in Shape Diver, like the PDF data. I am going to show you the PDF uh, next. And finally, we have this part uh, that generate all the 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 tables, the the labels, the steel parts, and a group on uh, send this. To, to shape diaper with the with the library of shape diaper no well with this we with these complex algorithms we can uh, we can generate uh, with a little a little box of, of shape diaper we can generate uh, these types of configurator this is a final output of of SR model, the, the the these two, and we we can see here the difference between the the initial workflow that they had in the uh, before 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 Graph Hopper and and Shape Diver because they they had this a lot of of Excel's a lot of file 
uh, the Excel files, and now they only have a configurator and they can define the door, they change the door of the, the, the location of the door, or change the, the type of the structure, for example. We can change a lot of things in the in the algorithms and wait for 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 the for the process and we can generate a, a lot of a lot of change in the in the in the structure and generate the tables with the with the quant the quantity of the parts of 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 a steel parts of for example the the can the quantity of the of the connection parts if we generate here finally, uh, we can export this uh, to an, an email to ShapeDiver and this create this this PDF file that we can see the the, the, the drawings of the of the structure and the the computes of of all of this structure and we we send this uh, a mail to ShapeDiver and this open a new opportunity to to develop a new opportunity to to a new self for 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 a star model for example this is the, the first um, tool David, that, that sorry, we are sorry going to, to show yeah yes, yes, David, yes. can you hear me uh, i think yes, this yes, is yes. great Let, let's just jump real quick to optinave for the last 10 minutes yes 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 and then then we can uh, um and then we can uh, uh, maybe jump back to this uh, by, by the end because we still need to to explain optinave um yes, Manuel, I am going to make your presenter now. Uh, just one second. Um, I'm Manuel from ConstructSoft and I will talk about Optinave. Uh, Optinave is our web configurator. Uh, it's a web app that performs structural analysis on cloud using ShapeDiver and a Grasshopper algorithm that includes um, a wine load generator according to the Euro code, Caramba 3D for the structural analysis and Geometry Gym for the exportables. And the user can obtain a first number of the cost, materials and forces for the model in seconds. The app algorithm integrates uh, geometric parameters, cost and budget, structural analysis, and 3D modeling, obtaining an optimized solution uh, for the warehouse steel structures in seconds. Um, the objective of this development was to make easier the budgeting process for structural designers and show the possibilities of structural analysis uh, on cloud. And in the back, we developed it with David um, a Grasshopper algorithm that used Caramba 3D for the FM calculation and Geometry Gym for the IFC, IFC exportable. And using JDiver uh, allow us to, to share w uh, this with the world and not only uh, to the Grasshopper users. And, and let's take a look of the Grasshopper algorithm. Uh, here it is. Uh, it's a big, uh, like the star model uh, algorithm, is a big and complex algorithm, almost 4,300 components and uh, computational time running in local around 0 0.5 seconds. And as you can see, it's not a spaghetti monster, and that's because we follow the shape diver recommendations for keep the algorithm in order. We group the parameters, we identify the parameters with a name, identifying the type of data. We use this template with different colors. So I have to admit that uh, in the beginning, uh, these rules uh, can be difficult to, to follow uh, for a, a computational designer because uh, we always want to go fast, but the all the time that we invest in the in the order is is then the the key for fixing issues and, and sharing sharing the definition with with others and the other key of the of the algorithm is the computational performance so uh, we wanted to have a cloud application uh, fast and fast enough to to able the user to try a lot of parameter combinations compare results and select the best option. To achieve this computational performance, uh, we 
compound and reuse transformations. We uh, develop a step algorithm uh, that um, the most time consuming uh, process come last. For example, all the IFC model only is generated once uh, the, the user press the download button. So we follow the shape diver rules and we get a, a really nice uh, performance. The algorithm is divided in five groups. Uh, first, the geometric definition. Uh, we try to keep it simple uh, using only points, line, and meshes. Then we have uh, our wind load gen generator that uh, resumes all the, the rules of the Euro code. And the other important part of our algorithm is the Caramba 3D part that allow us to to find the best solution. Uh, Caramba 3D has a component, a component named uh, optimized cross-section that looks for the best option for a structure. So the final step are the exportables. Uh, we have two options, one with uh, geometry gyms that allow us to, to have an IFC model. And the other one is ones uh, that David developed for, for Optinave, uh, that is an XML uh, prepared to be read in SAP 2000, that is one of the most uh, uses uh, engineering software. And the idea is that the user can download the, the XML file and continue the, the, the modeling in local. Um, sorry is, uh, if I'm going fast, but I don't want to bore you. And if I launch OptiNave, um, we start the application in a few seconds. And we will find uh, two panels, uh, one in the left, one in the right. And the left panel contains uh, different tabs to the give the the user to 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 complete the the parameters uh, here the user can modify all the the parameters uh, of interest for for defining a, a warehouse um, geometric parameters in the first tab for example look at the the nice uh, view and the nice materials of shape diver renderizations and uh, we have the uh, wind load generator. Uh, this is really interesting for for structural designers because they can they can see how the the location of the structure affect in the in the structural response. So once the the user set up all the the parameters, uh, it is possible to to calculate the model. Uh, we also have uh, some uh, JavaScript code to develop this uh, that allow us to modify the language and all of these panels. And if we press calculate, um, the model will be analyzed and optimized. And uh, now we have a model that all the cross sections are optimized. And in the bottom, we can, we can find the total weight of the structure and a list of the cross-section adopted for each element. And now, for example, um, if we change some geometric parameters or I will add a snow load to, to see what happened with, with this structure in real time. Uh, OK, so if I add the snow load, the, I have some red, red marks that are telling me that the structure is not enough. So I can uh, add some more frames to the structure, really easy. And look for the best solution. The structural designer uh, can add some hunches, uh, some gable columns uh, in order to, to find uh, which is the, the solution with the minimum amount of, of steel that uh, verifies the, the design. Maybe the, this snow load was too much for 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 this warehouse but once we 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 have a, a correct uh, model the idea is that the 
the uh, structural designer uh, can download the model because the aim of Optinave is not to replace the, the structural analysis software. It's only a, a tool for the first numbers and obtaining a, a fat budgeting. But then the engineer had to continue the, the calculations and all the, the design in his uh, software. Uh, we have the possibility to download the, an IFC. We complete the form and we will receive, as uh, David shown in, in the star module configura uh, configurator, uh, if we uh, fill the, this form, we will receive an email with the model. And if we open the model, uh, we will have uh, this IFC model uh, with all the elements and information to continue detailing, detailing maybe in, in Tecla or, or in, a, in other software. So um, Optinave uh, was our first app uh, working with ShapeDiver. And we are really proud of it because it's, it's been uh, used for, for teachers, for uh, all, all kinds of, of, of professionals are, are using uh, our solution. And we invite you to, to try it uh, and send your feedback because we are uh, constantly uh, developing next versions. So um, also, I want to mention that in Contursoft, we are offering this service of developing this type of applications using the, the power of uh, ShapeDiver, Grasshopper, and an uh, engineering team uh, with a lot of energy. So if you have any idea, don't hesitate to, to ask. And uh, I think that that's all of my part. And, and now we have a minute for questions. So thanks all for listening. And, and thanks to ShapeDiver and Ezekiel for the invitation to this season. So maybe if anyone, maybe Edwin, do you have one question that you want to ask uh, Manuel? Edwin is our head of projects at ShapeDiver. And anyone else who has a question, uh, make sure to ask them. We can maybe squeeze one, two, three. Manuel, let's just try to be quick, and then we can leave some more comp complex questions for the very end. Okay. So here we have a question from Gigi's. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, it's a question that I also had, but it's basically what was the biggest challenge develop developing such a complex algorithm? Uh, I think that the, the, the most difficult part uh, was the computational performance to keep it simple and fast. And that, that was the, the, the difficult part. Uh, try to don't use uh, solids or intersections and, and try to, to use minimal geometry. Uh, that was uh, difficult. OK, thank you. Uh, I have another question. Um, well, you said that this tool is not made to replace like the software that nowadays engineers use, but uh, could there be a day in which such a software like uh, the one that we have cloud using the, using the power of uh, cloud cloud computation could replace this software? Um, I don't think so because uh, in in a in a calculation uh, software there are a, a lot of things. Uh, imagine that the, if you have to to have a seismic seismic uh, analysis and or dynamic analysis and this uh, could be really difficult uh, on cloud uh, i i don't think that it could be possible to replace but uh, yes to to start from here and not start from scratch in, in the, your in your engineering software okay can we right. do more questions? <laughs> Shall uh, we well, it's already, it's already a little bit late. Uh, let's just let's move with, with Dan. So thank you very much, Manuel. Now you can uh, just turn off your camera so we can now switch to, to Dan. Thank you very much also to uh, David. So Dan, I'm going to make you a presenter. Just make sure you select the speaker and the mic appropriately when I do so. Hey, sorry, I think I was muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. How are Great. you, Dan? Good, thank you. How are you? All right, we're doing. We're excited to hear you. Great. Um, well, thanks for taking time out of your day to come and listen to us today. Um, I'm a structural engineer at a company called WebX Engineers, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the new carbon modeling tool we've made called Cactus. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction to uh, for those of you that don't know us, which I imagine is quite a few of you. Uh, a bit of the background. To, uh, bit of a background into kind of traditional versus computational workflows and kind of 
why we bothered making the app in the first place. And then as kind of the other presenters have done, um, kind of give you a few of our graphs of the files and the actual app itself. Um, so we're a company of engineers um, across a lot of disciplines, so structural, civil, and building services. Um, we're sort of a medium-sized company, about 70 strong, uh, split across two offices, one in London, one in Birmingham. And I think kind of as a company, kind of our main ethos is Firstly, sustainable designs, but also being quite in innovative in the way we do those. Um, so just some pictures from just a handful of our projects. Um, so we work in the traditional materials for buildings, um, so like concrete and steel. Um, but we also work in some of the more kind of interesting and fun materials that are a bit more sustainable as well. So in that top left, that's a load-bearing stone building. Um, which is reasonably uncommon, um, but something we specialise in quite a bit. And then those bottom two right images, um, one of those is a composite timber and concrete roof, and the other one's a composite timber and stone roof, um, which again are pretty specialist construction typologies, and not something you see commonly anyway, but also super low carbon, um, which is the main reason for using them. Um, so in the traditional design process, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the rebuild design stages. Um, this is all UK based, but I imagine there's a similar thing kind of globally or at least across Europe. Um, but essentially as you work from left to right, you're going through the stages in a project and you're slowly working up um, your level of detail. So the place where this tool is aimed at is somewhere between one and two, and this is right at the concept stage where um, you're basically designing what the overall form of your building is going to be, um, what materials and it's going to be made out of and what it looks like. And because you're kind of at the earliest stage of the building, it's where some of the biggest decisions are made. And also, more importantly, um, the, the decisions that are made at that stage are going to have by far the biggest impact on embodied carbon. Um, so I guess traditionally this image at the bottom is a sketch from a real project we've done in the office, um, which was a single story vertical extension um, of a concrete framed office building just down the road from our office near the Barbican in the city of London. Um, so in this instance, the the geometry of the framing was reasonably fixed based on the existing column grids of the building, which is what that sketch is showing. Um, so whilst we didn't have much room to play with that, the next question kind of was, uh, what materials do we make that framing out of and what's the impact of those materials? And this is a set of sketches that was made um, for that project in particular. Um, so there's a few different options there, some steel, some concrete, some timber, and kind of different ways of integrating those. And so the key things that clients and design teams want to know is going to be how big are all of those things, so how deep are the floor zones, how much material does it take, because that's ultimately going to inform how much it's going to cost to build, and then also finally what's the embodied carbon of all those options. Um, so on the bottom is a graph we made for those. And so <clears throat> kind of taking into consideration all three of those things, the design team are going to make a decision together about which one to take forwards. Um, so the main issue with this approach, it's perfectly fine. And it's something you do on every job. But it's reasonably repetitive and it's reasonably time consuming, um, depending on how quick you are. But an engineer with a couple of years worth of experience is probably going to take, I don't know, on average, say 20 or 30 minutes for each one of these options. Um, <clears throat> so we had an idea that we kind of needed to digitalize this process a bit and make things a bit quicker. Um, and we were trying to explore different ways of doing this. Um, so Grasshopper felt like a natural choice just because of its inherent parametric modeling. And the only issue is that not everyone in our office knows how to use Grasshopper. And if you don't know how to use it, 
can be quite intimidating and it can also be quite easy to break uh, what someone else has made. Um, we did also look at web apps, but again, it was kind of the reverse. So you get a very friendly user interface that's quite difficult to break if it's made well. Um, but the disadvantage is, is uh, well, we're not web developers. Um, so making something that renders a parametric 3D model is going to be quite tricky to build for us. Um, so we didn't actually kind of was just stuck at the idea phase for quite a while um, until we came across ShapeDiver. So actually the um, pros and cons of both of these different methods were actually kind of the inverse of each other. Um, so having ShapeDiver as a link between Grasshopper and web development meant that uh, the cons of each side kind of disappeared and we got the pros of each one. Um, so it just kind of seemed like a very natural um, crazy choice, like a bit of a no-brainer. Um, so kind of the first step was setting up the Grasshopper script. Um, I've got a live version of it, but just before I jump onto that, um, just kind of go through kind of like our approach to it. So um, kind of app development isn't our day job. It's kind of just like a, essentially just a side project we have in the office. Um, so I wanted to keep the Grasshopper script really modular just so it means that anyone can work on it without destroying anyone else's work. And kind of in the future, if we need to build on it or adapt it, then it should be really easy to do so. So it follows like a really linear process. Um, it's not as tidy as some of the other examples we've seen today, but it's actually reasonably straightforward. So you've got the inputs on the left-hand side that passes on to like a slab design um, group, I guess you'd call it. Once you've got your slab design, that will give you some loadings that you can put onto your frame. And then there's two different framing selections that gets passed onto your foundation design. <clears throat> and then you've got something that processes the outputs at the end. Um, and then this is just kind of explaining so each one of these um, areas looks a little bit like this. and everything set up on string gate so um, you're only ever designing one material and um, each option so you're not designing every possible slab option every time you run it it's only doing one at a time just so it reduces the overall computation time and then also having these modulated so think at the top for example you've got timber design and then below that you've got steel design then you've got concrete design and so on then if in the future we decide we want to, I don't know, add a new material, then we just add another box, and um, all these boxes are clusters, and someone can go away and add that in. Um, can you see the Grasshopper script? Yes, yes, we can see it. Um, so the inputs that we start with, this is all sent to the Grasshopper script in ShapeDiver via just a text input, um, which is a JSON object. And um, we've got something that passes all of these individual components. Um, <clears throat> there's a little bit of pre-processing of these inputs. So, for example, you'll see on the app you can define a you can define a custom perimeter for your building, and if those points aren't quite in the right order, it will sort them out so that none of those lines are intersecting so it doesn't crash the program. Um, we then go on to the <coughs> slab design area. So you can see that it's just the string gate set up and then each of these represents a different design essentially. So first one is a metal decking design, second one's a concrete slab, third one's a CLT design. And then if you click on any of these clusters, They all look something similar to this, although it'll kind of slightly depend on what side is being done. Um, <clears throat> but we've got essentially a series of uh, structural capacity tables and it all filter through um, based on certain criteria. And then all of these clusters, they start the same inputs, but are some loads and some spans. 
and then they output the same thing, which could be like a, the description for the slab, the slab depth, and how much carbon is in it. Um, once it's done the slab, it goes on to the framing. Um, <clears throat> so the way we've actually defined the framing, um, we've kind of done like a primary and a secondary framing, which you'll probably see a bit easier when we go onto the app. Um, but again, it's the same kind of modular concept. There's a set bunch of inputs that go into all of these design clusters. One of them gets processed at a time, depending on what is selected in the app, and you get the same outputs for each one. So this is the concrete frame design cluster. Um, so kind of like a typical size, um, I'd say, for most materials. And it's essentially taking the geometry you've defined, the loads you've defined, and it's calculating the structural sizes of the framing members for you. Um, <clears throat> that goes on to the, found, the foundation design, which is the final step. Um, I won't go into any of these clusters, but it's a similar principle. There's different types of foundation systems. Designs one of these at the same time, so the loads and the geometry you've defined, and it spits out a set of inputs. And then at the end, all of these outputs are combined. Um, <clears throat> we present the information in quite a lot of different ways. Um, so splitting carbon up between materials and uh, if anyone's familiar with the RICs um, building types, um, it splits up between kind of framing and upper floors and columns and combinations and stuff. Um, so there's a bit of processing and working out um, basically how to group and categorize all of that. And then we have quite a mammoth uh, <coughs> JSON object that it spits out and it just has all of this information um, easily accessible on the web end. Um, so I think that's probably as much sense as it's going to make in five minutes. So I'll head back to the PowerPoint. Um, so then on to the actual app itself, which we've named Cactus. Um, so the application stack for this is the MERN stack, which is um, well, at least from what I know, a reasonably common web development stack. So that's MongoDB for the database storage, um, Express.js for the web application framework. Um, we've not actually used React um, purely because um, I only started learning kind of web development about a year ago and um, self-teaching, and I've just not had the time to learn that as well. Um, <clears throat> and then we're using Node.js, which is the runtime environment. And when it comes to the shape diver APIs, we're actually using two of them separately. So the inputs get stored as a JSON object for the actual calculations and the structural member sizing. Um, this goes through into a backend API request, which goes to shape diver. It runs through that script. Well, actually, there's two mirrored versions of the same Grasshopper script, one with geometry and one without. And so on the back end, we use the one without geometry, and it just spits out the raw data. And then so because there's no geometry being rendered, that one's really quick. And um, it takes about a second to get all the information about structural sizes and body carbon. And then we have a front end side to that where it's the same script, except when you update the parameters, it also updates the 3D model and the web app. Um, so they can, well, there's a few reasons for splitting up between the front end and the back end API. Um, it means we can run the back end kind of isolated to the front end. Um, so if you just want to do flip through some options really quickly, you can completely ignore the front end. Um, if you're not too worried about what it's looking and you kind of know what you're doing. Um, but if you do want that front end as an optional and you're trying to show off in front of clients and design teams and you want to show them like the 3D model you're working on, um, there's the option to do that. Um, so going on to the actual app, this is what it looks like. Um, there's a plan input here. 
So I think what's quite common on these kind of apps is that there's um, <coughs> a reasonably fixed format for the shape of your building. Um, and when you're trying to show your clients and demonstrate this to clients, it, they kind of want it to be specific to their building. Um, so the way we throw it can be for any shape if you define a set of coordinates. <coughs> Um, but yeah, so the main, the way we've kind of defined this, it will model this building. So it's going to be based on the shape you put and the target con spacings or the grid spacings, if you like. Um, so that all updates live. And then in terms of framing selections, um, we've got steel, concrete, and timber, which are all reasonably commonplace. And we've also got um, stone, which is kind of a bit more bespoke to us as an individual company. And we've also got a whole range of slab systems, ranging from metal deck slabs to concrete flat slabs. Uh, so if I just change this quickly. <coughs> If I just go to what with many would see is the cheapest and maybe default option for a building, which is a concrete flat slab. <coughs> um, within our outputs, it kind of tells you what this would be for this building. So it's on a five and a half by seven meter grid. Um, you'd need a 300 thick uh, concrete slab, 500 square columns, and some 600 diameter piles. There's a bit more. Um, Come back onto this later, so maybe. Um, but anyways, there's a structure, so in the 300 mil, you've got all your embodied carbon data there, and a scores graphic in the bottom left here. So this is pretty horrendous in terms of embodied carbon. And the way we've set this up is you can give it a name and then save it as an option, and then you can compare as so you filter through. So I've changed that to a steel frame building with CLT slabs. You can already kind of see that the embodied carbon has already dropped from about 300 to 200 kilograms per meter squared, and which is kind of going in the right direction, although it's not completely in line with 2030 targets. <clears throat> and again, here I'm just changing the view, so we've got the option between no view at all, wireframe, and 3D view. So this is where having the back end and front end API split comes, uh, is really handy. Um, so for this, um, this spits out your steel sizes and column sizes and the thickness of the concrete slab. Um, it shows you the embodied carbon split between substructure, framing, and upper floors. And it also splits it up between materials and I've actually not used this app on this aspect ratio screen size, so this is a bit squashed and probably something to fix. Um, but there's a radar chart for comparing the options as well. <clears throat> and then if Dan, I swap maybe, to some... maybe one, two more minutes before we jump into some questions. Fine, yeah, I'm pretty much done. Um, so if I swap to something that's hopefully a lot more... So yeah, swapping this now to a completely timber frame building. Um, you see that we've gone from 200 to 168 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared, um, which is pretty good. Um, that's kind of the general idea. And then as well, probably don't have time to go through this, but um, 
once you've got your bank of options, you can then automatically generate a report, which is sent to clients. And going back to this, which maybe takes like two or three hours to make, um, hopefully you can see how much quicker that app is and how important it is to kind of ensuring us that we can recommend clients um, basically how to convince them to build sustainably. All right. Uh, so I'll stop there and then if there's any questions. Uh, All right, uh, this has been fantastic. So for this section, uh, we've got our CTO and co-founder, Alex Schiffner. Alex, uh, you have some questions here. We have a couple on the Q&A for Dan, but maybe you, you, you want to start with a little bit? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, first of all, Dan, many thanks for your presentation. It's really amazing what you achieved there. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed by, first of all, by the performance you achieved and by, uh, essentially, if I understood correctly, it's uh, more or less, you did that on your own, right? Including the front-end development, is that correct? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. That's really impressive, yeah. Uh, just having understood that you started to learn web development a year ago, it's really impressive. Uh, maybe the first, um, first question um, is related to, um, um, to actually the data you're using there for the for calculating the imported carbon. When I, when I yeah. prepared and looked into your application, I came across the question like, where do those constant numbers come from? How much um, embodied carbon is in a timber or steel or whatever? And it's yeah. different for countries, right? So, how yeah, so um, we have a professional body in the UK called the Institution yeah. of Structural Engineers. Um, so they're the kind of professional body that us as individuals and as a company are registered with. So they have some guidance on basically those constants that are all agreed and are based on either European um, product declarations or from some research that was done by the University of Bath. Yeah. And mm -hmm. So we just um, use those numbers essentially because it's in line with recommended guidance. I see, yeah. But yeah, uh, completely right. It does depend on what country you're in and stuff. Um, exactly, yeah. Uh, um, well, one of our participants was asking whether you are taking into account uh, lateral forces in, in your calculations. Um, we are, but kind of as a... So at the moment, we're just adding carbon um, based on a percentage of the carbon for the vertical forces, based purely on the fact that we've not really had time to add that in yet. So it's on the development list to add in stability calculations. Um, yeah. But to be honest, for the height of buildings we typically work at, um, we would expect stability to be provided by some sort of uh, core arrangement within the building. Okay. And up to the height we typically design that that's usually determined by firefighting requirements rather than structural requirements. Right. So I think for us having a placeholder percentage for now is actually kind of fine. Um, I see. Yeah. But for the list. If, if I understood correctly, during your presentation you were showing that the structural calculations actually based, you're not using any scripts or a special plugin for that, it's basically all based on tables, right? Um, Table, table, table. Uh, essentially just for speed so if I was doing this yeah. by hand um, there's some pre-analysis tables you can look at so yeah. it's exactly the same way I would do it if I was using pen and paper exactly. because it's such an early stage thing it doesn't need to be 100% precise this is just for early stage yeah. option Very nice. and what's been the feedback from your team I mean I'm understanding that others were not familiar with Grasshopper and now they're able to access this via the Cactus tool what are some early yeah. impressions that they give you no, it's been good. Um, it's been used on a few projects so far. Um, people definitely enjoy using it. There's some discussions we're having about how best to present the outputs at the end, essentially. Um, yeah. But again, this is essentially the first pass. This is the first time we started using it. Um, and there'll be a bunch of room for development and kind of fine tuning as we go. Okay. Perfect. There's one more there, Alex. Maybe if yeah, there's there's, yeah. um, there's one question which I uh, found interesting to pass on is like uh, one participant asked if you could optimize or add anything to Rhino Grasshopper Shape Diver, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> you run into 
the main challenge you ran into? Or, uh, I think at the moment it works well for what we're using it for. So I don't think we have anything that we would be, God, I really wish it did this. Uh, mm. Maybe as we start ticking off our development list, maybe we'll find something. Um, right. nothing at the moment. You, you have an, an option in, in, um, in, in Cactus to actually also export the, the geometry, the line model, I guess, right? Um, we don't actually, just because okay. the geometry is quite basic. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Not often. Maybe one, one last time before we switch to our last presentation from Thornton Tomasetti. Yeah. How would you define structural framing? For example, bracing systems or moment frames for different options, as it may need to consider mm -hmm. human interaction for placing of such frames. Uh, I think that question, if I'm understanding it right, correct me if not, but I think that's kind of back on the lateral forces for stability. Yeah, systems. exactly. Yes. So again, um, yes. at the moment, it's just a placeholder allowance for the embodied carbon associated yeah. with that. Because um, we're not so interested in the yeah. exact building scheme we're working on. We're just looking at comparative options between different things. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it will be something we look at in the future. Well, this has been great. Um, I hope you can stay. For, uh, maybe at the end, we'll have some other questions for you. But in the meantime, yeah. uh, we have our next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, now let's go with Ben Hose. Let me just find him through here. Here he is. All right. Hello. Hi, Ben. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank Glad you for your to time here. today. Yes, we're very happy to see you and to have you here. Uh, so whenever you're ready, 20 minutes are yours. Let's go. All right. How's that, folks? Do we see a presentation? Yes. Yeah, we do. OK. Uh, thank you. All for having me. I'm Ben Howes. I'm the director of application development at Core Studio. Um, let's see. Quick agenda today. Uh, we've all tried to answer the why shape diver, why grasshopper question. I thought that was great. And then I'm going to discuss two different ways in which we're utilizing shape diver at uh, Thornton Tomasetti and our application development team. Uh, one, using it as a compute service, sort of invisible behind the scenes, just part of a bigger uh, application development uh, project. And then two, um, as an enterprise app catalog. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about both of those. I'm also going to show an embodied carbon <laughs> demo today. I, uh, I'm really, really amazed um, and proud to be presenting alongside such great projects. It was uh, really great to see, especially like hearing about how everybody was self-taught and just kind of sneaking this work in on the side beyond their day jobs. Um, uh, really, really impressive. Okay, so Thornton Tomasetti is a global engineering consultant. We do all sorts of engineering uh, work. Um, when I first started here, it was kind of easy to say, oh, we do skyscrapers and stadiums and really big buildings, uh, but we do much, much more than that now. Um, we're 1,500 people and we do uh, projects all over the world. Core Studio is the incubator of ideas within TT. We, we've been an R&D group that's been uh, active for, I think, I want to say 12 years, 11, 12 years. Um, do a lot of different work across the company. I'm going to show a few of these projects to sort of warm up to my, um, my little shape diver demo today. But um, yeah, we've been uh, we've been growing and sort of working across a bunch of different problem domains within TT and sort of adjacent to TT services for very many years. We're 25 people now. Uh, again, sort of spread all over the world. Um, a lot of these people's jo day jobs is development. So uh, I suppose like, you know, different in some ways. It's been really cool to see like 
uh, increasing company size seems to be the order of presentation today. I don't think that was um, intentional per se, but um, we're a big dev team. We do a lot of different projects. So I actually think the answer to why Grasshopper and Shape Diver has, has been like covered today. I think the examples that we've seen that people are able to self-teach and take expert domain knowledge from, from their professional lives and encapsulate it into little pieces of software and to expose that software on the web for others to consume, like that's the, the value proposition. And it, again, I'm, I'm super, super impressed with the work we've seen already today. Um, the fact that you can actually pull something like that off, uh, you all, co-presenters, um, I think proves this. TT does a lot of these, again, like uh, Sasha on our team made these slides, uh, these little GIFs, and just trying to show some of the complexity in the structural systems we do. This is like a big arena roof. We do a bunch of these. Uh, this is one Vanderbilt uh, in, in New York City. And this is one of these ones where, you know, we, we really got down to modeling bolts, the bolts in the skyscraper. Um, so highly, highly complex projects, big teams working on them. So lots of opportunities for automation. And I think if I can just speak personally a little bit, like Grasshopper is our favorite. We like building plugins for Grasshopper better than almost everything else. And it's just the best prototyping sort of environment we have in the AEC industry, I think. And um, our team's uh, been working for years, really, trying to get wider adoption within Thornton Tomasetti. We've failed a number of times with teaching exercises and marketing campaigns and been gaining a little ground back with lately with a um, tool that just targets structures. Um, but again, we're interested in ShapeDiver as a way to let the experts sort of be experts and help do that work of taking company domain knowledge and wrapping it up into little pieces of software and then letting the Shape Diver platform and the ability to build on top of the Shape Diver platform uh, be the way to sort of distribute that expert knowledge out into Thornton Tomasetti and beyond. Okay, so first couple of examples are about using Shape Diver sort of headlessly, just as a compute service. Um, it's a grasshopper grasshopper on the cloud uh, behind some other user experience. So one of our long running projects in Core Studio is spun out as a startup called Construe and it does structural interoperability. And one of the main challenges we see is dealing with the differences between a physical documentation model and a, an analytical model that's used for design and analysis. So, um, and I'm talking about connectivity of the center lines of all of the structural frames. So this app we built a uh, desktop side, you know, part of our construe toolbox that allows um, sort of focused connectivity analysis and repair of these models. And this is one of these ones we've, um, you know, this has been around for a long time. It's, um, it's widely used within Thornton Tomasetti, um, but we've, been keen to integrate this into the web platform. Uh, and that's sort of the plan going forward. We're in process on this one right now, but the idea basically is to take the same code libraries that run behind this custom piece of software, uh, embed them into Grasshopper plugins that could run on ShapeDiver, and then to call into that directly as opposed to having to deploy plugins to people, manage files and versions. Everything runs on the cloud, nice, nice. So that's uh, that's sort of the plan. Uh, I don't have a working slide for that yet, but that's an example I thought of, again, just, just using ShapeDiver as a compute environment. And again, to touch on the strengths of Grasshopper, um, when you're able to use ShapeDiver like this, you expand your developer pool dramatically. But a lot of those people that we saw on the, that slide are like, coders, you know, uh, the, the number of people who can code in Grasshopper uh, uh, is much larger in the company. So we think there's, that, that's a major benefit too, just being able to sort of get deeper into that development environment using Grasshopper. 
The next one is called swap. This one's a total beast. Uh, the question of lateral systems came up in that last one. And um, th th this one, uh, swap stands for shear wall automation platform. TT does these you know, uh, huge buildings with very, very complex uh, port in place concrete shear walls. And we've been working for a long time building this application out. It's got a 3D viewer, a 2D viewer, all this sort of like data management and interactive tables to take uh, design data coming out of ETABs and then actually do construction documents level rebar layout, which is a lofty target. Uh, we, we've been working on this one for a long time and we use Shape Diver in a number of different ways. It, it um, computes these two dimensional drawings and, including rebar placements and everything uh, based on data in the web application. We clear the database and pass that data to a ShapeDiver app and it passes back SVG, which we render. Uh, and it also contains the, it runs our core structure code, which actually does the engineering analysis and design. Um, so very committed, I would say to, uh, you know, ShapeDiver is the sort of platform behind this thing, which has been interesting. First time we ever did it. Uh, so it, um, it, 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 again, it sort of, it gives us a lot of leeway in terms of how we build these apps. We can be very nimble and develop in our preferred environment, which is Grasshopper, and leverage all the plugins and the whole ecosystem around Grasshopper to uh, solve quickly and accurately. Um, and we can also move really fast. Okay, so I think I'm a little ahead of time. I'll try and slow it down a little bit. This last sequence is about this idea of an, uh, an enterprise app catalog or sort of marketplace for these um, engineering apps. We've tried it this one a few times as well. Uh, this project asterisk was like 2017, 2018. This was our first foray into uh, machine learning, uh, sort of predictive structures. Um, but with this one as well, we uh, we sped that one up too much. Um, there's a whole series of, you know, Grasshopper on the cloud generates the wireframe and does a bunch of data management, very similar to the, the um, cactus example uh, we just saw, in fact, about sort of differentiating between systems and designing each system and trying to output uh, high-level uh, metrics. The second pass at this, um, sort of a predecessor platform here, uh, was a family of apps. So instead of one monolithic app that tries to do the whole building, and we, we still have those, those are the custom and typical <laughs> buildings. Uh, the idea was that we'd be able to break out a series of smaller apps. Um, and that, that's something that came out of the feedback of these systems was that it's great to be able to do the whole thing and do a quick takeoff. And we're still very interested in that. Uh, but um, there's also value in these kind of element level inferences, uh, system level prediction, all of these sort of, um, you know, kind of typical element or typical Bay studies uh, that can influence a project uh, early on too. So we built a number of these. This is an example of like uh, concrete columns versus steel column comparison, these column stacks. And uh, again, these are experiments using the, the machine learning models that our core AI team has been developing. Um, again, we've been working on that since 2018, we now have four uh, you know, full-time sort of data science machine learning experts in the team, which is amazing. And um, we're, we're developing a bunch of sort of next generation asterisk sort of uh, machine learning models that do structural inferences, predictions. And it's at that system level or element level where we're building this up um, similar to that app catalog of starting with individual elements, working up towards subsystems and starting to compose those subsystems into, um, you know, sort of building level complexity uh, stories, but much more atomic um, sort of development process this time. 
Uh, we showed this slide at AAC Tech this past year. This is sort of like proof of concept, steel, concrete, timber um, comparison using all these systems. So behind all of the, you know, the gravity systems, the floor systems, the lateral systems are a series of machine learning models that are doing predictions of all these. Um, and again, the goal is the sort of similar, I think, to a few of the others we saw. This isn't meant to produce CD level data like some of those other projects I showed earlier. This is a um, kind of a first pass ballpark to help influence decision making early in a project. Okay, so I do not have a very fancy custom uh, web interface. <laughs> um, we're, uh, we're running, I'm gonna do just a quick demo of one of these, uh, our latest um, steel uh, schematic design calculator. We'll see how this does while doing the screen share. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is kind of like, it's a tool just using vanilla shape diver just the platform and what, what exists in the platform. We have our own environment, we run our own plugins, so we're able to do some turbo mode stuff, but um, just, uh, you're looking at the Shape Diver platform. So in here, um, lots of inputs, like the other ones we saw today, we can go up and down. You can see a little, we're, we're not drawing the whole building here. Again, this sort of came out of uh, experience with that that asterisk model and schematic, like typical bay, typical column, some idea about a lateral system, um, gives you enough to do some of those comparative uh, sort of examples. Um, so you, if you really squint down here, you can probably catch like a couple of these numbers uh, changing as we fiddle with these settings, but again, all of these are sort of like the wind loads are tied to a, uh, a model that loads the lateral system. We've got a concentric braced frame uh, model in here, and we can control how many elements are in each direction. It's a great series of questions earlier about where to put lateral systems, and um, again, this is like just first pass, just some weight in the model for, or in the output for lateral. And the floor usually drives sort of big time. So let's see if we can like bump up our spans here and fiddle with the loading a little bit. I reckon we can see a little bit of a change just to, to give an idea about critical depths of um, girders, floor sandwich in a uh, in an early stage study. So, um, again, this is like, this is sort of a, it's one of a series of prototypes. We're iterating on these machine learning models. We're still sort of figuring what we're going to do in the Shape Diver platform and what we want to build custom web experiences around. Um, but I think both routes, uh, sort of build on that grasshopper value proposition that, you know, you, you, when you can run grasshopper on the cloud and connect it to users who aren't sort of willing or able to open Rhino and grasshopper locally, um, re really amazing way to kind of share design thinking and domain knowledge within, within the company. Okay. Ezekiel, I think that's yes. Perfect. Uh, it's been it's been great, Ben. So for this one, uh, Matthew and Alex can can join me here. Um, so we can start a little bit of a Q and A. We do have one question um, from Joaquin Escoda. He's asking if these apps are used in house or do you use this with other companies, like when you with your yeah. clients. Both. Um, so a lot of the apps, like um, some of the, you know, Asterisk and these other public facing projects of ours are always meant to be value adds for our clients. Um, so we, we do share those and um, do get actual people 
using those. Um, but the like swap, for example, that shear wall tool is in house uh, focus. That's kind of competitive advantage tool for us. Uh, so a little bit of both. We've also exposed some of these machine learning models, like um, we're, we're working with TestFit. They're consuming one of our, our uh, column models to size columns in their, uh, their parking garages. And um, we think there's lots of opportunities uh, out there too. Yeah. So do you think that most of the EC gains, low, lower hanging fruits can be gained from actually being efficient in the early design process? Do you think that before this type of, of, of tools that we've seen today, you were losing a lot of time, a lot of effort in that early definition stage? Um, how, how does that play about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we saw it kind of earlier today, like just comparing different building systems and trying to make a case for a lower carbon footprint system, for example. Um, you know, everybody's super focused on the bottom line and it's really hard to move the needle there. So being able to have answers at your fingertips right away, as opposed to having to say, oh, I'll get back to you in a day or two about that. You can pull up a slick tool on an iPad and, and actually make the case in person. There's major value there. Mm -hmm. we, we have one question here. How do you manage grasshopper files and version changes in a team? It's really hard really hard. I was curious about that with some of the other um, presenters too. Um, we've like, you know, I think code styles big and being able to just work with functions and blocks of code, uh, the, the sort of spaghetti scenario um, is untenable in collaborative scenarios. So you really got to be tight with your kind of standards. And again, it's tough. It's file management. People have done like GitHub tracking so you can work in branches using XML versions and that sort of stuff, but um, typical file management headaches, I would say. Do you guys agree you do grasshopper file management too, Alex? Save us. Final, final, final. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, we have a project team in house and uh, it, it's the same, similar issue Hard. there. Uh, yeah. I always tr like to try to advocate for saving models in the XML file format, but uh, it's, a <laughs> it's a fight. Uh, sure, but uh, yeah, even if you do that, of course, you, you don't have version management. Uh, of course, it's something we, we want to achieve on the shape of our platform at some point is to have exactly. uh, some kind of a version management there, right? Um, and you're not so far from, from that anymore, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, we have one more uh, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, we, in the end, we have, we have a lot of questions, so let's, let's go through them, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's another question about uh, uh, the adoption of the, the tools that you develop within the employees at TT in their day-to-day -day work, and how far, how yeah, how is far is that, yeah. Yeah, again, we've really, like, we've had projects that have totally flopped over the years. We put a lot of work into stuff, including working on Grasshopper plugins, where we thought, this is the one, right? Um, I wrote an Excel connector and thought engineers love Excel. So now they'll want to learn Grasshopper. Um, uh, other tools, like we, we have all these other automation tools and other platforms and they're, you know, widely used. Um, we're, you know, I think we're still early in the kind of apps marketplace uh, use case sort of research, what we'll see. Um, but people are very, very interested in the machine learning uh, model story and uh, again we're, we're we're working on testing that with shape diver uh, right now so we'll have to come back for a part two or report back on adoption mm -hmm. of those absolutely uh, there's one more here how do you keep object solid layer uh, object solid and layer hierarchies organized across modeling software object solid layer yeah Good question. I mean, in structures, I think we might have a like slightly like construe sort of battles with this, just in terms of visibility. For example, what to render in the web viewer, mm -hmm. different representation representations of the same object and different yeah. clients. Um, interoperability is hard. 
there's a lot of coordination. And I, I think with tools like Shape Diver, to some degree that lets you let you stitch things together, um, all those things, units, materials, matching all that stuff up is difficult. Attention to de detail, patience. Uh, any more questions with you, Alex? Should we jump to the final part? There's, yeah, the, can... there's one question that came to my mind, linking to what I asked Dan Cole before about the yeah. embodied carbon calculation. Because uh, I'm, how does it work uh, for, for you, actually? How, where do you get those numbers from, actually? Same. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of like published resources. Yeah. We've got a project called Beacon, an open source project that does this out of a rabbit model. Um, yeah. And it, that process is pretty well documented there. I'm not an expert. Uh, um, yeah. But all that stuff's sort of available, Alex, and the, the craft is in how you sort of, you know, apply the, the right multipliers. Yeah. And, but I think there's a giant, this is our sort of joke with asterisk, there's a big asterisk on all this and that it's comparative. Details matter, Alex, and it's like, you know, it gets super, super detailed based on regional differences. So um, exactly. everybody rounds it off. I found this embodied. Uh, I found this this calculator actually, um, which seems to be an initiative of different huge companies that uh, make this data available. It's called Embodied Carbon in Construction Calculator, and they they even offer the data via an API. So it could be interesting to. Nice. Yeah. yeah. There's right. so much interest in that story right now. It's great. Um, mm -hmm. There yeah. are there are some people in the industry who would like all of us to come together and do one instead of all the different flavors. Um, how feasible is that? Another discussion. How feasible is that? That's hard. That's hard. <laughs> Not impossible. Okay. I think if you look at, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of examples of big collaborative projects, open source projects that work. So not impossible. But um, I think AAC is still pretty likes likes to keep it close to the chest a little bit. Absolutely. All right, Ben. Well, thank you very much for your time. We're going to jump into the closing remarks, and then if there are any questions, please start sending them to the Q&A. Specify to which presenter you have the question for, and we're going to add them as co-organizers so they can all join here in these final minutes. Uh, let me just share my screen real quick just for the final remarks. Perfect. So thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. As we've seen from our clients' case studies, the future belongs to automation tools that can boost the efficiency of your existing workforce. By embracing parametric design and cloud computing, you can work smarter, faster, and with greater precision, delivering your projects on time and within budget. If you want to learn more about our clients today and their case studies, please visit our blog section on our website, shapediver.com. There you can find detailed information and resources to help you get started with Grasshopper and Shapediver. Additionally, if you would like to review a project with our team at Shapediver, please feel free to send us a contact request via our website. Thank you again for joining us today, and we wish you the best of luck in your future projects. So with that out of the way, let's jump back to uh, the final Q&A. All right. So guys, thank you very much. I mean, I don't think you've ever met, like this is the first time we, we put together, uh, you know, some of our uh, greatest uh, case studies. Like I think Ben mentioned, it was, you know, the common the common uh, denominator was, you know, how how easy it is to use Grasshopper and, and, and Shape Diver to, to solve some of the most uh, common problems with sharing Grasshopper files with other people, right? It is common that, you know, you guys here are all familiar with Grasshopper, but the moment you need to extend it to someone else, either they don't know Grasshopper, they don't have the right workstation, they don't have the plugins installed, or maybe you don't even want to share the full IP, right? Because you've been working on that for months or years, and you're not simply going to send the Grasshopper to someone. So in this case, it's exciting to see how everyone is solving, you know, seemingly the same problem with, but with the tools that, that are available to you in your own specific way. And um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any 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 comments. I, I I see here that Ben mentioned, you know, that Dan was also working with embodied carbon, and uh, you know, I think that that was that was quite interesting. It was not on purpose, <laughs> but I, I find it, I I think at the end I find it interesting that both of you can see. Okay, this is how you know others are solving the same problem. Do you guys have any comments on that? I have a comment about the IP uh, bit, actually, Ezekiel. I think that's actually really important. We we we've seen major value, and again, like. 
our lower level core, core code libraries, um, we think it's safer to run those behind APIs as opposed to giving them out to a thousand technical staff who then uh, absolutely can kind of walk out with them, right? So uh, that that's sort of part and parcel of that value proposition for us too. Not only do you get um, Grasshopper on the cloud and everything that brings with you, but it's a sort of a cheap way to stand up a sort of a protected API. Yes. David, can you speak? And, if you can, and I was one of the, of the most interesting parts was when David was showing how Star Model was using Excel before having yes. you know, every single thing in Excel and then just completely substitute that for a single Grasshopper profile that, as they mentioned, they follow Edwin's uh, best practices. Edwin, we cannot see you in the screen. Um, but yeah, I think that that was quite interesting. David, Manuel, what can you tell us about moving your client from Excel into Grasshopper? Do they use Grasshopper? I don't think they do. They just use the apps that you created for them. Yes, yes. Uh, this is one of the most important things in Shape Diaper because we can process all the the algorithms and create a simple uh, interface where that the client can use and they don't use Grahopper then only show Grahopper when <laughs> when we show them the, the algorithms, we show them uh, a definition for example. And uh, with this algorithms press uh, it, it was really nice work because because we started to a simplification of the model, like for example, create uh, elements and superpose the elements and intersect the elements between them, and create the or calcul the calculus the the of the length of the element mathematically. But the most simple uh, uh, way to do that is create the the perfect model the the real length of the of each element in all the on the model because with this length we can create uh, uh, after that we can create with it with this data we can use this data again and create the the, the computers of the all the structure only uh, measure the the length of the element so yes the, the this was uh, one of the most important project that we use in, we did in, in Grahopper. Um, well, yeah. uh, Man, Manuel developed another thing in, with with the uh, password in Grahopper with Shape Diver. Uh, if you remember, it yes. was for, uh, very creative ways of using you know all yes, these for, Grasshopper th elements. That's that's because uh, Star Mall, uh, they don't have a uh, rhinoceros or a grasshopper. Only know to access, accept how to access to Shape Diver platform, and there uh, they upload uh, their prices list. And I we figured out how to make a, a admin tool. Uh, a different tool with the same algorithm, a uh, different tool for, for them. They, they are using it in local, they are using it a, a lot. They are not using anymore the Excels and they are really proud of the, the product. They, they show to all, all the people this this web configurator. That's that's great. Ben, you were mentioning, oh no, it was it was it was Manuel, but I remember from the first time we spoke with TT and Rob was part of the conversation. There was this mention of reusability of the Grasshopper files, right? So before you would create a Grasshopper file for a specific project and then you would just forget about it, right? But now the the goal is to reuse. Don't just throw away all the effort put into into one single project. We can reuse it for multiple ones. Is that still the case? I'm assuming. Yeah, absolutely. There was a comment earlier today that. You often go back into a Grasshopper file and you can't rem remember. Uh, you know, it's been so long. But if it works, you don't have to. <laughs> it just works. Uh, and we've got a few, like, some ancient clusters. Like, we've got a tributary area calculator that still works. And it just warms my heart, you know, because um, you're able to get a lot of value out of the, these sort of, like, scrappy little investments. Uh, and I think one of the most important uh, aspects of the uh, best practices from Edwin, am I still on? I'm, I'm still on, or was I? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So is, is that, you know, the effort Edwin puts in, in his um, best practices that he teaches on YouTube is for when you have a, a team that's growing and they have to go back to a Grasshopper file so they understand it. 
right? They don't have to start from scratch. They don't have to ask, hey, what does this do? What does this do? It, it's always clear. And uh, yeah, we really, we really think, uh, Edwin, I don't know, maybe you, you work with a lot of our clients, helping them, you know, uh, understand how to use your best practices. Best practices. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I've been working with Grasshopper for a long time. Every day, every single hour, every day I'm in Grasshopper, eight hours a day. So basically, uh, thanks to that and for the amount of years that I've been doing it, then I've been able to iterate different ways of organizing the model, it, different ways of also uh, dealing with data, sharing it with these cloud applications and using JSONs and other kind of a database to be able to make models as generic as possible so that they can be as, as reused as possible, as compacted as possible, and as fast, etc. Um, so, yeah. And now we share all of that in YouTube anyway, so everyone yeah. can, can learn about it. Uh, there are some questions in the q and I don't know if we want yeah, to exactly. go from it, through it. So we have a question for Ben. Is why and how did Thornton Tomasetti consider incorporating an idea incubator into the company? Yeah, great question. I saw the follow up down there too. Like, how much time does it take to get, you know, to get oh, yeah. on this R&D? So I'll try to do both. Um, I think if I could take a whack at the origin story, like we started supporting project teams. We were pretty specific in that. When we were smaller, it was sort of like, you know, there were wins on projects and that gave us a little bit of trust and we were able to grow the team and start to make investments into technology and those bets or those investments take longer to pay off. Like I think when you're developing grasshopper definitions for project teams and sitting right next to people, um, you can work really, really quickly. And Shapefiber didn't exist back then, but um, you know, the, the ability to kind of reuse that code, like you were just saying, as you heal um, project to project with slight modifications was an early win that we were able to take an idea and sort of like establish a working pattern with project teams. Um, the, like the application development ROI was probably a little longer term. Like we, you know, I think we found, had to find our footing and try, especially like I think we struggled finding the right questions to focus on, right stories to, to build around. Um, so like that, that took a long time. And again, now I, with the machine learning work we're doing, um, uh, that there's value beyond just, you know, sort of moving the needle for engineers and project teams. But a lot of that work is still research, hasn't really like made it out into the company and has been able to like move the needle for people. So that's a big investment. Um, and I think all of that speaks to like why does Th like Thornton Tomasetti is in long on this. Uh, at, yeah. And um, major support for our group and company wide with, with R&D efforts. They're uh, unique in the industry in that way, I, I would posit. I don't know another company is the company of our size that's doing it on this scale. Yeah, management has to be very aligned with the goals that you guys propose and they have to trust you that it'll- Absolutely come yeah. back in the future that's that's great so um okay i think we answered this one as well there are or, or, or the last the one i compared or at the complete beginning, the there complete is beginning. two questions from to for k houses yeah for for matthias can you hear us Matthias? i think you're muted yeah i'm here all right perfect so edwin do you go through the, those questions yeah so one question is can you come can you re reconfigure, rearrange the rooms, or are they always following the same layout? Uh, mm, it depends. I mean, yeah, they are pr probably mostly the same because uh, we configure the, the house itself, but uh, not the, the interior design. So mostly the, the, the interior rooms are like blocks which we use. So, so it's just, it's just, you know, it's just a placeholder. When we design the building, we mostly do the, the the interior like normal architect. So, so by hand, let's say, <laughs> not not automat automatized. So, so it's a different thing. But, but yeah, sure, I can make another another versions if I want. Okay. okay. And the second question, um, I mean, it's a bit like 
so if there is only one design and, and you just change number of rooms, length, width, it's kind of similar to the same layout, no? Yeah, so it's the, the outer design is similar, no, with the... Yeah, yeah, that's the point, that, that the structure is still the same, like we saw a lot of... Uh, a lot of structure uh, application of uh, of grasshopper, and we do the, the different thing that we just uh, we just have just one uh, structural design, but uh, or construction design, but we just uh, have a different different uh, room lay layout inside. But yeah, in in the future, the the, the, the examples I saw today is like really really interesting that you can do much more things even with machine machine learning like for example now we have to we have to uh, place the building on the side like you know like by hand or the human has to do it but uh, i can imagine that you have a machine learning when you put the plot uh, into into the application and it decides for you what is the best position on a on a on a site for for a building because of the sun and and, and the slope and stuff. So, so there, there is a lot of lot of potential for for all these things. Like even 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 we want to make a different uh, maybe different structures like one floor house, two floor house, three floors house. So, so there is a lot of options, but uh, yeah, it's just too wide to do everything. So we have to yeah, and you're just three first guys our thing first. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think we've run out of questions for now. So uh, thank you very much for those who stick around, um, stuck around for the for the final questions. And obviously, thank you to everyone, you know, our valued clients for using Shape Diver, giving us your feedback. We hope the latest iterations and improvements we've made to the platform, our development team led by Alex and Mathieu, um, have been proven. Uh, worthy of your time because you guys invest a lot of time using Shape Diver all the time, so we appreciate that. Um, if there's anything else, if there's not anything else um, that we need to add, then I think we can call it a webinar. Thank you very much, and thank you for everyone else. And uh, yeah, sticker. Um, make sure to visit our website. Send us any emails. Contact our, our our clients directly if you have any questions. And I wish everyone a great Tuesday. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.